Good evening. Welcome to Jacobin's May Day live stream. My name is Paul Prescott. I'm a contributing editor with Jacobin Magazine, and I'll be with you all tonight. Today is International Workers' Day, a day to celebrate and memorialize the working class from around the world. Um, in many countries today, you would see huge mass demonstrations by unions and labor parties to mark the occasion. Um, and fortunately, most of these demonstrations will be bigger than what takes place in the United States. But this holiday actually originated in the United States to commemorate the Haymarket general strike that was waged in 1886 for the eight hour workday. Jacobin celebrates International Workers' Day with solidarity subscriptions. Um, the goal of Jacobin is always to reach millions of people with the argument that creating a better world requires challenging those who profit from the misery and exploitation of others. And one way to reach more people in is through this special May Day offer. Um, so if you use the code below in the description in the show notes, um, it's just May Day 2023, all one word, all capitalized, May Day 2023. You can get a full year of digital access for just $1 or four beautiful print issues of Jack and the Maz Magazine for $10. And um, I really want to emphasize that the lifeblood of Jacobin is as a print magazine. Um, nothing can really replace being able to hold the magazine physically. Jacobin has beautiful uh, design and aesthetic and artwork inside its pages. So if you click the promo code in the show notes, uh, you can get a $1 digital subscription or a $10 print subscription to uh, Jacobin magazine. And this offer also applies to gift subscriptions as well. So if you have friends or family, you want to introduce to Jacobin. Um, Jacobin is great for you know, being able to be read by normies, by all kinds of people. This is the perfect time to do so. You can get as many gift subscriptions as you want at this rate and help spread these ideas to your friends and family. Just follow, again, the link in the description to the promo code. Um, so we have a great guest today to talk about the current state of capitalism, what it means for labor organizing today. So I'm really excited to introduce Professor Richard Wolf, who is Professor of Economics Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and visiting professor in the graduate program in International Affairs at the New School. He's also founder of Democracy at Work and author of countless works. Um, so welcome, Professor Wolf. Glad to have you. Thank you, Paul. I'm very glad to be here. All right. Um, so first question, I kind of want to zoom out a little bit. You know, I think it's easy for um, labor organizers, whether it's rank or file workers in their unions or people who work on staff uh, for unions to kind of get lost in the weeds of our particular fights against particular employers. So kind of broadly, I want to ask you, why is it important for labor organizers to know about how our capitalist economy functions at a fundamental level and how should this knowledge inform our organizing? Well, it's a great question and, you know, we could spend <clears throat> God knows how much time going into all of its facets. But I'm assuming you want to try to get to the core, and I'm going to try to respond in that, um, in that spirit. So let me begin by being as honest as I know how. The economic literacy of the American people is really poor. It's not the fault of people it has nothing to do with being smart enough. The American people are more than smart enough to understand. But it has to do with a systematic ignorant, ignorance making. It's the only way I can think of to say it. Of our school system, of our media, of our business and political leaders. They constantly tell a fantastic story about what's going on that makes it impossible for interested, perfectly capable, average human beings to understand what's going on, to get a grasp on it, to understand their own position in it. And the only way that I can imagine breaking the hold of the incredible nonsense, and I'm gonna give you some examples in a minute, uh, the only way to do that is if the labor movement, because no one else has quite the motivation 
and quite the organization and quite the history to bring to this. So the labor movement is in an extraordinarily good position to do something about the confusion, the misdirection, the lack of, of teaching, the lack of education that the working class needs to better its own situation. You know, when labor unions were stronger in America and in other parts of the world where the labor unions are stronger than they are here, as, as for example, in much of Western Europe, they devote a great deal of time to workers' schools, to producing really good analytical literature, having workshops, having summer encampments where people can learn. They put a lot of emphasis. We don't do that in this country anywhere near the way many of them do, and it shows. And so I would argue that the labor movement needs to learn more about how American capitalism works, largely in order to guide its strategic decisions, for sure, where to concentrate your effort, how to present an argument. But the labor movement has a second associated task, and that is to teach, that is to explain, that is to give Americans an alternative way of understanding what is happening to them. So let me give you a couple of examples. Right now, there's an awful lot of noise going on in the newspapers, on TV, in social media, all over the place, about the so-called debt ceiling crisis that the Congress and the president are all excited about. Well, let me explain it to you because it's really quite simple. The United States Congress basically makes the decisions with the president about how much money to take in in taxes and how much money to spend on all the things that we have our government spend on. And it doesn't take an advanced degree to understand that you have to raise money to spend money, just like we all have to earn income to be able to spend money. The government has to do that too. And the basic way the government has done it and still does it is by taxing, taxing corporations, taxing individuals, taxing property, taxing income, taxing expenditure. And then it uses that money to pay for the services, to maintain the highways, to support police and fire, to provide support for education at all levels, to have a defense apparatus, and so on. And clearly, if the government chooses, and those are our elected representatives making this decision, nobody else, if they choose to spend more than they choose to raise in taxes, they're going to have a problem. And the problem is severe in the United States because everybody wants the government to spend on them, and the same everybody doesn't want to pay taxes. So the politicians are caught here in the middle. And the ones who have the power to shape what corporations do are, of course, corporate, excuse me, what the government does are corporations. They have the profits that we all help to produce, but a tiny group of big corporations has the bulk of the profits, and they use those profits to shape and influence politicians with donations to the party, to the candidate, to the committees, with lobbyists that they hire to do the work of those elected politicians. And the rich people do it too, but for the mass of the American people, they have no such resources, they have no such big interests, and they don't have the means, they don't have the incentive to do anything like work on Capitol Hill to shape the politicians. So what happens? The government spends the way people want them to, from defense to social security benefits and everything in between, and the government taxes. But because people don't like to pay taxes, 
it can't tax them much more than it already does. And it dares not tax corporations and the rich because they have the money to get the politician who does that out of office and a more compliant one in. So here's the result. We spend a lot. We tax a lot less. How is the government going to spend a lot if it doesn't raise taxes? The answer is borrowing the money. That's the only way the government can spend more than it raises in taxes in our system. And that's what the government has done. Year in and year out, with very few exceptions, it's borrowed money for at least most of the last century. And so the national debt, the total of all those borrowings year in and year out, is now enormous in the United States. We are the largest debtor country with the government debt of any country on earth. We are borrowed up to here. Being a rich country, we borrow a lot. And periodically, people have gotten frightened about the borrowing. So they put a ceiling. The Congress passed a law, you can't do more than this. Over and over again, because of the way the government works and because of the way the system operates, we bump up against the ceiling. We keep borrowing more and more. We hit the ceiling. Then there's a big theater. That's what's going on in Washington now. And then the ceiling is raised and we borrow again. Why? Because the government is spending so much more. It's not mostly that. The spending is predictable. It does go up, but we understand that. The real problem is the taxes. And that's not faced. If you go to Washington today, the Republicans say, we either raise the ceiling or we cut government spending. The Democrats, we must raise the ceiling. We can't do government spending. Notice, both sides don't say a word about taxation. Why? Because it's off the table. Why? Because corporations and the rich want it off the table. It's not off the table in logic. It's not off the table in economics. It's not off the table in common sense. If you don't want to borrow, raise it in taxes. You won't have to. Then you don't have to worry about the ceiling. But nobody talks like that. Not the newspaper, not the social media, nobody, not the politics. They all quietly, and here's the problem, quietly move the taxes off the table. And that's where the labor movement comes in. Because the labor movement could and should say, stop. The taxes in this country are fundamentally unjust, fundamentally unfair to labor. They're the ones who take it on the chin. Taxes have been cut for corporations and the rich for the last 60, 70 years. Let me give you a few examples just to drive it home. Back in the 1960s, the, the highest rate for the richest people was in the 90% level. Now it's 37% is the highest uh, rate of taxation for the richest people. That's a tax cut the likes of which working class people couldn't imagine, let alone enjoy. Let me give you another example. Americans pay property tax on their home. They pay property tax on their car. They pay property tax on their little business inventory. Those kinds of property are taxed. If you live in a town or a city, you know that you pay the tax. If you're a renter, part of your rent pays the landlord for the tax that the landlord has to pay. But there are kinds of property that are not taxed. Let me give you the example. Stocks and bonds. If you have a $100,000 house, you pay tax, property tax, to your town on that house. If you sell that house and use the money to buy a portfolio of stocks and bonds, your property tax is zero. Where in the world did this idea come from? The richest 10% of Americans own 80% of the stocks and bonds. There's your answer. Our tax system is screwing the working class of America. And if the mass of American workers understood it, they would be in the streets if the government dared, dared 
to play the charade they're doing now, talking about raising the debt, which means interest payments we're going to have for years into the future, or suffer the cut of social programs, which many of us depend on. That's not the choice. The choice also includes raising taxes. And you know, if we raise them, and I only gave you a few of the examples I can give you, we would do much to reduce the inequality here in this country, which the majority of Americans in poll after poll say they want to do. Imagine with me a labor movement that could explain what I just summarized. Make the American people understand it. That would be a labor movement that would once again become a leader in our society because unlike the academic world, unlike the politicians, and unlike the media, the working class, the labor movement would tell it like it is. Not be afraid to put the injustice right in the forefront where we can overcome the injustice, avoid raising the national debt, and build a labor movement that the rest of the country will be proud of. That's great. And can you say a little bit more about the role of workers and labor in changing society? Um, so obviously, we, there are a lot of movements and issues um, out there, whether it's racial justice, gender justice, environmental justice. But what is it about labor and workers that the left keeps coming back to? Why is it so important that the labor movement intervene in a period like this in order for things to really change? Because the labor movement being what it is, a movement of people based on the fact that they're workers, the overwhelming majority of American families operate because the adults in them are working. That's, that's been true throughout our history. It's true right now. And therefore, the majority, the overwhelming majority of Americans have something in common something that they share, something that they value, something that's very important to them and gives them a basis for working together, for working in a collective way to change the society. In a democratic society, the majority is supposed to rule. Respect the minorities, off, absolutely. But it is the majority. And I think we always come back to labor because of that fact. Yes, we have different histories, different skills, different religious commitments. All of those differences are important and need to be respected. But they exist alongside of something we really powerfully have in common. And if that common thing, that thing that identifies with us and we with it all across the board. You know, people sometimes say, well, what percentage of Americans are employers? Well, the statistics suggest 3% is the maximum. Well, what are the rest of the people? They're employees. The overwhelming majority of them are employees. That's what we have in common, that we need to be paid for the work that we do, that the system needs to find work for people just as much as people for the work. And a good, healthy society does that. And the labor movement takes the lead because it cares about what we all care about, having a decent job, making a contribution, being properly paid, being able to raise a family, et cetera, et cetera. Corporations, employers are not the same. Employers will tell you, and we should listen to them when they do, they're in it to make a buck. Profit is the bottom line. I've taught in business schools. That's what we teach future business leaders. You're there. Your decisions, your priorities are making money. But for the rest of us, the vast majority, our priority is having a decent life, work, income, leisure, relationships with other people. So we're the ones with the interests the goals and the incentives to reach them that can make a society good for the majority of people. Since that's what good leftists have always believed, that we can do better than the system we've inherited, then of course the, the labor movement is our natural ally, is the agent positioned in society 
to make it better. And I don't, I don't want to shy away from the negative side of that. The working class is also in a position to withdraw its labor, to say, look, if you don't make the society decent, we are not going to do the work without which this society cannot run. Yes, labor has power in its numbers, in its cohesion, in its being positioned in a certain way in society that makes them the natural ally for those of wa who want us uh, do, want to be able to do better than what capitalism, our existing system, has been able to do. I also think the labor movement has a very particular role for the left now. The reality is that the British Empire, out of which the United States emerged, shrank over the last 19th century into the 20th. And it was replaced by the American empire, certainly since World War II. And like all empires, the American empire was born, rose, evolved over time, and then it declines. That is difficult for people to face, difficult for them to understand. But that story of birth, evolution, and decline has been the story of every other empire, the Greek, the Roman, the Persian, you name it. And we're not exempt from that. And we've had a really good run here in the United States for the last hundred years, but it's over. The decline is evident wherever you look. The decline of the role of the dollar in the world, the decline of the ability of the United States to call the shots in military confrontations, even though we spend more on military than the next nine countries combined. The reality is China, Europe, Brazil, India, they are challenging us. That's what always happens. And we have to accommodate and we have to adjust. And the employer class wants to hold on to all the privileges, all the wealth that they accumulated on the upswing. The only way they can do it do that is if on the downswing, they make all the burdens of a downswing fall on the working class. And the working class should not, need not accept such an unfair. Yeah, we were excluded, we workers, from much of the rise up. We cannot have that be done to us as it declines. And I think the labor movement is going to feel it, is already feeling it, and wants to push back against it. That's why the people at the bottom, in many cases, the Amazon workers, uh, the, the Starbucks baristas, all of them who know what it's like to get by on 12 bucks an hour or nine bucks an hour are taking the lead. I even think that's why so many college professors and school teachers, the kind of people who, who think and for a living and try to teach young people what's going on in the world, they're figuring it out and they're realizing we can't be made to be the fall guy, the scapegoat for an economic system that has been run by the employer class to this point. They can't now see it decline and say they're going to keep all theirs. We have to be the ones that sacrifice. The labor movement feels it and the labor movement's thinkers and teachers can articulate it. We have a lot going for it to build a movement that really shapes the way this country works. And if I might be so bold, today on Labor Day, you mentioned that people around the world are celebrating that, and that's true. But I would draw your attention to France, where today, Labor Day, across that country, in every sizable city and in many small villages, the people were in the streets saying to the French, yeah, you're part of the Western capitalism that's declining, but you're not going to make us pay because the program in France of their president is to take away two years of retirement, make them work an extra two years during which they put into the retirement, but they don't take out of it. They worked all their lives, these elderly workers. They will not permit 
the French government to solve its budget problems on their back as it refuses to raise taxes on corporations and the rich. And they're going to win that struggle. And Mr. Macron, their president, has already lost his future, but he's going to lose this struggle too. And I think that's a sign we in America have our own traditions and our own ways of doing it, but it's a sign of the direction in which things are going. The 70% of French people support it, and this whole struggle that is a beacon for people around the world has been organized and led by the labor union federations of France. All six of them got together with a unity you've never seen before in France to fight this fight together. That kind of unity, that kind of leadership for a social struggle, that's what the labor movement is capable of. And that's why we, those of us who think of ourselves on the left, want to be, need to be in close, constant interaction with that labor movement. And we're going to return to the labor movement in the United States in a, in a moment. But for now, let's switch gears to maybe some current um, economic news. The, the dominant economic story, I think, for the last few years has been inflation. Um, so what, in your view, has been the actual cause of this inflation? Um, how has the Federal Reserve attempted to address this issue um, on the backs of workers? And what are the ideas you think should be coming from the left about how we, we deal with inflation? Wonderful. And it's a perfect, thank you for the question. It's a perfect way to make the point I've been trying to make. The discussion about inflation in this country is unbelievable. It is so skewed, so tilted in one direction that it, it kind of gets me steamed up. Let me explain. And let's start with the simplest things that have to be understood and are never discussed in the press. Here's what the word inflation means. It's a general increase in prices of the goods and services we buy. That's all. It's not complicated. It's not uh, many layered. None of it. It's simply a summary word when prices in general are rising. Not all prices have to rise. They don't all have to rise the same amount. No, but just a general rise. Okay, that's what an inflation is. Now, to answer the question, why do we have one? Let's be real clear here because you can see the politics right in it. Who is in charge of prices of goods and services in the United States? The answer employers. One of the things employers do is set the prices of whatever it is they make or produce. If you're a working person, you've never been invited into a meeting where you're asked your opinion, what should be the price of the software we make or the ice cream we produce or the, 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 the bridge we're building? They don't do that. The employers or people they choose, do this work for the employer. The employer decides whether the price is going to go up, whether the price is going to go down, or stay the same. So the first level of answer to the question, why do we have an inflation, is, and only is, because employers, in general, are choosing to raise prices. They don't have to. No one is holding a gun to their heads. No politician is commanding it. They're choosing to do it. Now, what percentage of Americans are employers? As I said, maximum 3%, which means that an inflation happens when 3% of our people decide to raise prices that the other 97% of us have to pay. It's right off the bat, unfair and undemocratic. A tiny group of people, we didn't elect them. The people who run our businesses are not elected. They don't stand in competition with others for the position of employer. So this tiny minority makes a decision and all of us suddenly realize that we may be facing too much month at the end of the money. 
Okay, so that's the first thing. Now this next question. Well, why, why would the employers raise prices? Why would employers who cause recession do that? Well, the answer is the same answer you give to the question why employers do anything. Employers are taught in business schools and they learn in the marketplace that their job is to make a profit, to make money, to use money to make money. They are rewarded if they're profitable and they are punished if they are not. So the answer to the question, why do corporations raise prices is it's because it's profitable to do so. Or to be more precise, it's more profitable to do that than to do other things that could earn you profit. Capitalists are always doing that. They're looking at their different opportunities to decide which of them is the best way to enhance your profits, and then they go in that direction. That's their job. If they're a member of a board of directors, that's what they're there for. If they're top executives, that's what they get the big bucks for. So that's why an inflation happens. Here's the problem that may confuse you. And that's why our politicians and our media are so off the track. Polit our employers, understanding that they're the ones who cause an inflation, don't want to be blamed for it. It's not good public relations to be out there jacking up the price because the rest of us don't want to pay higher prices. We can't afford it. It pinches our finances, all the rest. So long ago, corporations understood that when you raise prices to make more profits, you have to tell, here we go now, a very different story to the mass of people. And here are the stories that are hot this year. Number one, there are supply chain disruptions. In other words, wherever we get our inputs to our business, it's taking longer, it's costing more. Uh, we're having all these problems, you see, and that's why we have to raise prices. Well, the answer is, and here I'm going to be an e economics professor, this is all BS. Every sizable corporation has a purchasing manager and a purchasing department. You know what their job is? If there's a problem with purchasing inputs to the business, you have a plan B and a plan C. It's your job to overcome supply chain disruptions. Any purchasing manager who came to the CEO of his company and said, I got supply chain disruptions will be fired. That's your job. Go get a solution to that job. So that's that's not a real answer. Here's another one that's even worse. Well, we have to raise prices because our workers are demanding higher wages. Statistically, this is simply lying. The wage increases over the last two years that we've had an inflation have been systematically and continuously less than the prices going up. So it's not the prices going up because the wages are going up. It's exactly the opposite. Wage earners are trying to raise their wages to keep up with the rising prices, and they're only partially successful in ever doing that uh, on a national uh, basis. Here's another uh, explanation. We, some, we had a pandemic. Well, that's getting a little closer because the pandemic did have something to do with it. For certain kinds of business, the pandemic was difficult. If you were a restaurant, if you were a store of many kinds, you didn't have the customers come in, it was too dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. Those businesses did without profits for much of the year 2020 and much of the year 2021. So now they want to catch up on the profits they didn't make by jacking up the prices because that's the fastest way you can make more profits. And that's why they're doing it, to make more profits. Now, there were other companies that did well in the pandemic, and you can notice many of them don't have to and don't jump 
to raise prices. They don't need it. But all of that shows you that the motivation for an inflation is to improve the profits of the people who have the power to raise prices. You and I don't have that power. We don't run a business. We don't have the opportunity to raise prices. The best most of us can hope for is that our union, if we're in one, or our desperation, if that's what we face, will pressure the employer to give us a bit higher wage so we can at least partially struggle. The labor movement ought to explain this. The labor movement could generate enormous support in this society if it explained what I just did and then took a stand to say, hey, we can do something about this. And this allows me to answer the second part of your question. The Federal Reserve was called in by the Biden administration, you should know, to deal with this inflation, which they usually talk about as if it were like a, a bad weather storm coming into the area, um, a mystery of the heavens. And here's what the Federal Reserve did right away. Okay, we have to fight the inflation. We're raising interest rates. It blew my mind. What do you mean you're raising interest rates? The only debate became how soon do we raise them? How far do we raise What? Stop. Raising interest rates never was the only way to deal with an inflation. It never was determined in any forum that it is the best way always to deal with an inflation. The United States has used at least two other anti-inflationary policies in recent history. They would be much better for workers. They would work faster and they would be more equal in who they hit. Rich people don't care if the prices go up a little bit. The rest of us do. It's not a fair way to deal with an economic problem. Never was. Let me give you an example of what American Americans did. It's 1971. August 15th, to be precise. The president then, Richard Nixon, gets on radio and television, says we have a bad inflation then, which we did, and here's what I'm going to do, said this conservative Republican president. I'm declaring a wage price freeze. As of now, any business that raises its price, we will come for you, we will arrest you, and we'll throw you in the clink. Any worker or union that pushes wages up, we will do the same. That's why it was called a wage price freeze. The inflation stopped on a dime. It didn't disadvantage the workers who couldn't keep up with rising prices. Yeah, it froze the wages, but it also froze the prices. The first one was set for 90 days, and then it was extended because it was so successful. You didn't hear about that over the last year and a half. We only heard about the Fed is raising interest rates, the debate about that, as if a wage price freeze had never happened, as if it didn't belong in the conversation. That's exactly like putting the tax increases off the table. It's talking about our problems and the solutions as if the working class didn't matter, as if the experts know everything. And what they're doing is hiding what would be better for the working class off the table so that there doesn't develop a movement. A, a well-educated, economically literate labor movement would bust right through all of that, would say, hey, what about a wage price freeze? Or maybe do what President Roosevelt did in the Second World War. When he said prices aren't going to, we're not going to allow anybody to raise prices. And the way we solve the problem is we're not going to use prices. We're going to ration things. The government printed ration books. The way you got a gallon of gas or a quart of milk or a pound of meat or coffee was you had to use a ration ticket. And you know how the government distributed ration tickets? According to people's needs, if you had a lot of kids in your household, you got a lot of milk tickets. 
And if you were two elderly people, you didn't. You got other things. If you were rural, you got more tickets for gas because you have to drive long distances and so on. A rational way to distribute things with no inflation to worry about. I understand that rationing, wage price freezes, rising interest rates, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. They all have their pluses and minuses. But we live in a country that keeps some of them off the, off the table, off the agenda. They don't want us to weigh pros and cons. They don't want there to be a democratic discussion. They don't want the majority to pick a policy that's best for them. They want to keep it for the rich at the top. And so everything done is done for them. They are rich. They don't care if the prices go up a bit, and they don't care if the interest rate goes up a bit. The rest of us shake in our economic foundations with those things. That should never have been allowed. And the only social force I see that could make this into the issue it can and should be is the labor movement. And um, aside from the inflation, there are a lot of strange things happening in the economy yeah. right now. Uh, we, we have the uh, phenomenon of Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Um, there are some fears of a recession looming. So broadly, I know this is kind of an unfair and difficult question, but how would you characterize the, the current economic period? Like, where do you see our economy really going in the next you know, medium term uh, future? Okay, let me do two things. Let me respond about some of the other items you mentioned and then you know, go into that last part of your question. I want to make fun of the financial geniuses that we allow to run our banking system or monetary system. Here's what those ge geniuses have done, and I'm just going to take the last, I don't know, four to six weeks. First, we have the geniuses in the Silicon Valley Bank. They managed to drive what I believe is either the 15th or 16th largest bank in the United States into a complete and total collapse. Not only did this involve the gross mismanagement of that bank by the financial geniuses running it, but that bank is supervised by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, because it's in the geographic area that that bank is responsible for. And the kindest thing you can say about the Federal Reserve Bank's financial geniuses is their job of supervising the failure of the Silicon Valley Bank is almost as bad as what the Silicon Valley Bank geniuses did to destroy their business. I want to remind you, the Silicon Valley Bank is the bank lo located in the single most important dynamic core of the American economy today, which is high tech, you know, which is Apple and Amazon and all the rest of them, many of whose headquarters are located in the greater San Jose, California area that the Silicon Valley Bank served. So here they are in the middle of the most profitable, most dynamic sector, and they make a holy mess of it. Second set of geniuses are in the Signature Bank in New York. It is either the 15th or 16th, you know, the partner with the Silicon Valley Bank collapse in California. The one in New York had financial geniuses that were all about the crypto phenomena. They knew it would be a pathway to millions of dollars of profit and growth and the new phase of the hum and on and on, and they destroyed that bank. Then we had to show that financial genius is not an American monopoly. We had the collapse of one of the biggest banks in the world. It's called Credit Suisse, located in Switzerland. And then, and I don't mind saying this, at 4, 4.20 this morning, in the middle of the night, as if you were a thief in the night, the Federal Reserve of the, the United States, together with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, did another financial genius move. They took a completely collapsed bank, 
the First Republic Bank of the United States, dissolved it in effect by selling it to the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, the biggest bank in the United States. Let me maybe make sure you all get this with me. One of the biggest banks collapsed because the people running it, those financial geniuses, made a mess of that. Third huge bank to collapse in the United States in a month's time. But they did what? They gave it, excuse me, they sold it at a real bargain basement price to the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, which is already the biggest bank in America. So let's see, the biggest bank already has become hugely bigger by the solution to the failure of another big bank. You know, back in 2008 and 9, when our economy collapsed, we learned the phrase, too big to fail. Our banks, our big banks, were th- seen to be too big to fail. The idea being, if they collapse, they take the whole economy down with them. What did we just do then? We made the biggest bank, already too big to fail, even bigger, and therefore representing a bigger risk to all of us if it fails. This is unbelievable. This is so irresponsible that you have to ask yourself, wow, the power of Jamie Dimon and his cohorts at the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank to gather in the collapsed other bank, almost a cannibalization of our banking system, making himself even bigger, didn't occur to anyone. No one says a word. We're supposed to be grateful that J.P. Morgan rescued what was left of First Republic. He didn't. He gave, ate it up. He became even bigger with even more outsized influence on what happens. And who has the influence? These geniuses who are providers of wreckage after wreckage in our banking system. A labor movement could call out this process could make sure everybody in America understood the outrage of all of this, the unacceptability of it, to make the biggest banking corporation even bigger and therefore even more powerful in the halls of Congress and the state capitals. Where is this country going? Where is the economy going? Well, I I know this is going to be upsetting, but... I don't believe you want me to tell you the stories you might wish to hear. I believe that Jacobin is committed to telling it like it is. So I'm going to try to do that. This is the worst shape of the American economy in my lifetime. And you can see I have white hair. I've been around a while. I was born in Youngstown, Ohio. For a while in my life, I thought that the obvious decline of the economy of Ohio in that area, a decline hallmarked by the end of our steel industry. I had hoped and thought it was limited to certain Midwestern areas, places that are now called Rust Belt and things like that. But what I've had to understand as I grew older and studied economics is that this is the way capitalism works. Our early capitalist industries were quite successful in New England. But after a while, as they grew, they looked elsewhere for other workers they could maybe pay less to, for other markets where they could sell profitably to. And they tended to leave New England, which is why it's full of the leftover factories that sit empty. And it moved to the Midwest, to places like Youngstown, Ohio, to the South, to the West. And then the, eventually the same thing happened and, and the Midwest became the Rust Belt as industry moved to the South, to the Southwest, to the Northwest, to California and so on. But it doesn't stop, friends. Then capitalism figured out why are we limited to the United States? We can pay workers way less 
in China, in Russia, in, in Brazil, in India. We can make a four, and those are the fastest growing markets in part because we're moving there. And capitalism, which came to the United States, built it up, gave it prosperity for a century, has now moved on. Its vibrant core is in China and India and Brazil. General Motors sells more cars in China than it does in the United States, and the examples are endless. We have to face that. We have to face whether we're going to go down keeping the richest of the rich that way and the rest of us take it in the chin. Or we have to say, no, no, no. We're the mass of people. We can work out a livable arrangement. You know, when the United States grew the new empire and the old British one fell down, the old British one tried to stop us. That's what the independence war in 1776 was. That's what the second effort of the British to control us in 1812 was. They lost those wars, they gave up. And for the rest of the 19th century, Britain and the United States worked out a live and let live system. The United States grew and the British glided slowly down, a lot less upsetting than if they had tried more wars. We have to understand we're in a different phase of the rise and fall of an empire. And we need the labor movement, the majority, to shape how that's going to be worked out. I don't want us to be lost in either a growing poverty of the lower half of our people, if not more. I don't want it to be lost in terrible wars that we, like the British before us, will lose. I think there's an alternative, but it needs the solidarity, the community that a labor movement can give it to finally have the ability to shape the future of this country and the way we talk and think about it. It should have done that in the last 75 years. It couldn't. Now it has to rise to the occasion. And the job of the left is to be a good ally, a good coalition partner in that process. And that's a great segue and a good question we're going to end on, on on May Day is, you know, there's clearly something in the air with the labor movement right now. I mean, we're seeing organizing, new organizing at companies like Amazon and Starbucks we thought we would never see. It um, feels like every other day there's a grad student union that's either on strike or forming. You know, we've had strikes at Temple University, Rutgers, University of California, University of Penn just formed a union um, last week. We're seeing reform inside existing big industrial unions, reformers elected in the Teamsters, reformers elected in United Auto Workers. So there's a lot happening right now, even though at the moment union density still remains pretty low. But you know, what do you make of what's happening in the labor movement? How do you interpret these changes that are going on right now? Well, like you and I would guess like most of the Jacobin community, I'm elated. You know, I only wish it had started you know, years earlier. But I'm grateful that it's happening. I think it's an enormously important historic phenomena. The labor movement is awakening. A new generation is rising to the fore as it should be, uh, taking leadership as it should be. I've been a professor all my life. I tried 10 different times to organize professors into a union, couldn't get the first base. Now it is, as you rightly say, it's exploding everywhere. I think people grasp in a kind of gut level way that the world is changing, the position of the United States inside it is changing, and that if the mass of people don't rise up to claim their entitled rights to shape that future, it will be shaped by the tiny minority of employers, the employer class at the top, and they will be continue to do what got them to their position of wealth and power, which is put profits first. And that's not, that may be good for them even now, but for the mass of people, it doesn't work. And I think the slogan 
or the slogans we should have in our mind is we, we the people, we can do better than what this capitalism at this point in its history is offering us. And we ought to be able to say it. We ought to be able to say it out loud and begin together to craft a better world and move in that direction. Well said, and a great note to end on. Well, Professor Wolf, thank you so much for joining us on May Day. And uh, to our audience, thank you for tuning in. And again, remember, we are offering a promotion uh, today as part of May Day. Uh, if you follow the promotional code in the show notes and in the chat, get $1 for a digital subscription and only $10 for a print subscription to Jacobin with a promotional code. Um, so thank you again, professional, uh, Professor Wolf. Um, happy May Day, and thank you, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And thank you on my part. I appreciate your invitation, and I appreciate the contributions Jacobin is making as we're all trying to move in this May Day-inspired direction. Thank mm -hmm. you.